Ramanas and Dr. Jilay Lim for making me a part of this Education Symposium 7 regarding the advances and management of gliomas. After the excellent engaging talks by Dr. Anand, Dr. Albert and Linda, I would now switch gears to the medical oncology part and talk about the advances in glioma therapy. And especially since we do know about chemotherapy like say temozolamide or irinotic and bevacizumab or say for instance the PCV regimen. So let's try to look beyond chemotherapy and see what the future has in oh hold and what the future holds for our patients of high-grade gliomas rather than talking the entire gamut. Let me try to focus on the high-grade gliomas. And so, are we going to get out of the tunnel? There seems to be some light at the end of the tunnel, but are we going to get out of this tunnel? I will try to focus on multi-kinase inhibitions, some antibody drug conjugates, looking at the metabolomics, targeted therapies, gene therapies, and immunotherapy. Dividing my talk into six sections. So in section one, we'll talk about inhibiting various kinase pathways inside the glioma cell. And so we'll talk about the MKIs or multi-kinase inhibition. As an example, I'll take this publication in the Lancet Oncology, which talks about comparing regorafenib, which inhibits multiple kinase pathways inside the glioma cells to lomustine. So these are patients of recurrent GBM who have had at least a 12 weeks of completion of radiation and then after the RTT mozolomide, these patients have relapsed. And you randomize these patients in the regoma study to either regorafenib or lomustine. And you see that What's important when you're looking at these patients is not objective tumor shrinkage, but even the disease remaining controlled also makes a lot of difference. And so Lomoxtin gives you a 20% disease control rate, which with the MKI regorafenib becomes 44%. In almost half the patients, we end up having a disease control rate. But what's most important in the tri-factor of efficacy is do we have an advantage in overall survival? And regorafenib gives you an advantage of approximately two months in absolute terms. With regard to the hazard ratio, 0 0.50, which means a 50% reduction in the risk of death when you use regorafenib in our patients of a relapsed GBM or recurrent GBM rather than when compared to lomostine. Multi-kinase inhibitors like regorafenib possibly are looking at beyond chemotherapy in our patients of relapsed glioblastoma multiforme. So that was about the MKI regorafenib. In section 2, we'll talk about using some potent cytotoxic molecules, which otherwise are so toxic that you can't infuse them intravenously. But however, you tag it to an antibody and make it an antibody drug conjugate. This cytotoxic potent chemical is now only in minute quantities tagged to an antibody. Say, for example, this drug by name Dipatuxizumab mafodotin. So, Dipatux is essentially bind, bound to the cytotoxin. It now enters the glioma cell and then liberates mafodotin, which is a cytotoxic chemical, a potent microtubule poison. So, essentially, you're talking about targeted chemotherapy. The chemotherapy is targeting and entering the glioma cell. And so let's look at Dipatax M being used in combination with temozolomide versus either temozolomide or CCNU in patients of relapsed GBM. And you find the hazard ratio of 0.68. The combination of Dipatax M plus temozolomide is better than either temozolomide or CCNU alone. In fact, 20% of patients are alive at 20, 24 months by adding the antibody drug conjugate to standard chemotherapy tumor. And as you can see, the curves are separating beautifully, telling us the advantage of using antibody drug conjugates in the management of high-grade gliomas which relapse or recur. 
So, and that prompted the investigators to use this molecule up front. But what's logical may not be oncological. It seemed logical that what worked in the second line setting so well might actually work better in the first line setting. But however, uh, in the first line setting, you found there was no OS benefit at the interim analysis. Very few drugs have ocular side effects. So for example, voriconazole, we all know can cause some ocular toxicity. Similarly, uh, this drug also can cause reversible ocular toxicity. So antibody drug conjugates can cause eye side effects. And if you keep a watch on that, then it would be a reversible adverse event. And that's why carefully monitor your patients if they are put on temozolamide plus d m So that was about antibody drug conjugates. In my third section, we all know about genomics, proteomics, and transcriptomics. The era is now coming in the future. We'll talk about metabolomics, talking about the metabolome of the glioma cell or the cancer or the neoplastic cell. And so in neurology, in neurosurgery, we talk about some molecules like ornithine, eutrecine, spermidine, and spermine. Now, this is basically the polyamine metabolism. Looking at the amines like ornithine getting converted to eutrecine and then spermidine and spermine. The enzyme OEC ornithine decarboxylase converts ornithine and then the polyamine metabolism goes forward. There's a drug by name eflornithine which inhibits this enzyme ODC, ornithine decarboxylase. So what does ODC do? Constitutive elevation of this enzyme triggers tumorigenesis. It continues to have the transplant phenotype. As the grade of the cancer increases, the levels of this enzyme keep on increasing. And that's the importance of ODC as a cancer and especially glioma target. And so if you could use a drug by name eflornithine, which is a ODC inhibitor, it inhibits the enzyme ornithine decarboxylase. So this was a phase three study where patients of anaplastic astrocytoma went on to receive either PCV or PCV plus eflornithine. And they found that the median overall survival improved 2.8 years. So that clearly tells us that we are not looking at an advantage in just response rates or progression free survival, but looking at a real overall survival advantage happening in these patients. When you try to target the metabolomics, the polyamine metabolism, for instance, by using this drug by name eflornithine. Of course, when you add one more molecule to a triplet of, say, the PCV chemotherapy regimen, you might have some increase in adverse events. But as you can see in the box, the adverse event increase is in the range of 2 to 12 percent only. So not a great uh, accumulation of adverse events. So section four, if we can identify a druggable target, like say for instance, anti-RK fusion or BRAF mutations, then you could actually use drugs which can target these druggable targets. And that you do by doing uh, what is called a CGP, Comprehensive Genomic Profiling by Next Generation Sequencing. And so ushers in the era of targeted therapy in the management of high-grade gliomas. For instance, this therefore becomes precision medicine or precision oncology. So this was a clinical trial looking at 18 patients of primary CNS tumors who had the anti-RK fusion present by molecular profiling. And the end point was to look at the objective response rate. So we use a drug by name larotrectinib, which is an anti-RK fusion inhibitor. And you look at 14 eligible patients, 14 evaluable patients to see and get an objective response rate of 36%. A simple oral pill, larotrectinib, is able to target these TRK fusion positive primary CNS tumors. Now look at the disease control rate, 14% complete responses, 20% partial responses, 
64% stable disease. So 100% disease control rate, essentially no progressive disease at all. And the median progression free survival is close to a year, 11 months. Similarly, in a recurrent refractory solid pediatric tumors in the central nervous system, there's a drug again by name Antrectinib, which also is an anti-RK fusion inhibitor. And so you end up getting measurable and durable responses in these NTRK1, 2, 3, or ROS1 positive tumors. So that's the beauty of using, of identifying druggable targets and then using drugs which can target these abnormalities specific only to that glioma or CNS tumors. Fifthly, we'll talk about a glioma gene therapy. And I would definitely suggest all of you to look at and go through this article which was published in the Frontiers in Monster Neurosciences talking about glioma gene therapy and virotherapy, which means therapy with oncolytic viruses. Virotherapy involves the use of oncolytic viruses. And in this article, you have two figures where they talk about oncolytic viruses, how they induce glioma cell death on one hand by infecting the cells and killing them. On the other hand, when the cells die, they start liberating not only the viruses, which infect the neighboring further glioma cells, but they also cause the liberation of various tumor-associated antigens, chemokines, type interferons, and damage-associated molecular patterns. So an oncolytic virus enters the glioma cell. The glioma cell is killed because the virus replicates. And then these viruses further infect the neighboring glioma cells. More than that, they also liberate various tumor-associated antigens and that alters the, the, the atmospheric milieu in and around the tumor, which causes recruitment of various defense molecules which are involved in immunosurveillance, like the CD8 positive T-cytotoxic lymphocytes, antigen-presenting cells, memory CD8 positive T cells, and that leads to a cytotoxic response by these natural killer cells and, C and cytotoxic T lymphocyte. The second figure in this article talks about the ek 3 l gene therapy, which essentially involves the usage of first-generation adenoviral vectors. And these adenovirus ve vectors encode the thymidine kinase and the FMS-like tyrosine kinase 3 ligand. You inject them into the tumor cavity following surgical resection, and then you end up with all these six patterns happening here, including first starting with mm, the dendritic cell recruitment to the tumor microenvironment, then causing the immunogenic cell death of the glioblastoma multiformis cells, also resulting in a presentation of the tumor antigen to dendritic cells, trafficking of the activated T cells, finally causing cytotoxic glioma killing by these activated T lymphocytes, ultimately resulting in anti-GPM immunological memory. And it is this memory which has immune surveillance can prevent recurrences or relapses or maybe prolong them for a much more longer time to result in improved progression, free survival, ultimately resulting in an improvement in the overall survival. The future, therefore, seems to be glioma gene therapy involving various oncolytic viruses. And I showed you these two figures in this excellent publication talking about the future being glioma gene therapy. That's all hope we will be able to use and exploit the advantage of these anti-glioma gene therapies. And lastly, I'll end my section with this section six, which talks about immunotherapy or using the immuno-oncology molecules in the management of biomass. It essentially talks about unleashing the force within, and that's why immuno-oncology molecules bring a new hope to cancer treatment. The Checkmate 143 trial looked at bevacizumab as single agent compared to nivolumab as the immuno-oncology molecule and recurrent GBM. And what they found was the response rates with bevacizumab are 23%, but only 8% with nivolumab, the immuno-oncology molecule. 
but the median duration of response. So in those patients who respond, when the numbers are small, but the duration of response is close to a year. So though the numbers of patients who respond might be less, but in those patients who respond, the response lasts for a longer time, almost double when compared to bevacizumab. Similarly, you are finding no improvement in the progression free survival to your right with nivolumab, but it doesn't hamper the overall survival. It remains 10 months with either nivolumab or bevacizumab. But then we want an improvement over the current standard treatments. And that's why this phase two study in recurrent GBM looked at adding bevacizumab to the amino oncology molecule pembrolizumab, expecting that adding pembro to the anti vegf treatment, which means an IU and anti vegf combination, possibly might be better than immunotherapy alone. And unfortunately, again, here too, you could not find a major improvement when compared to single agent IU molecules. And that's why we need to question why is it happening that immunotherapy is not working so well in high grade gliomas which recur or relapse. Importantly, it is also linked to the dexamethasone usage. So we know immunotherapies are going to stimulate the body's immune defense cells, and then these immune cells will ultimately attack the neoplastic. Uh, cancer tumor. But dexamethasone, if it's used, then dexamethasone it will cause immune suppression and that's why it can blunt the immune response which we expect with the immunotherapy molecules. Number two, it's all about biomarkers. In a newly diagnosed lyoblastoma, one third of patients will be having overexpression of PDL1 in more than 5% of tumor cells. Whereas in recurrent GBM, this drops down to only 17%. Not only that, once you use an anti PD1 or a PDL1 antibody, then since you have blocked that, the tumor cell is able to activate and produce what is overproduced, what's called a CD38. And CD38 will now cause dampening of the T cell activation. And so let's look at to your left. The tumor PDL1 is blunting the T cell, is blunting the T cell activation, inhibiting T cells. And so when you block this by using nivolumab or pembrolizumab, then CD38 gets overexpressed, which again prevents T cell activation. And so you can possibly use a combination of anti-PD-1 and anti-CD-38 because then you can block both PDL1 and CD38. So you by so and so by targeting CD38 by using the anti-CD38 antibody isatuximab, which becomes a second checkpoint inhibitor. The future therefore is talking about using an IO molecule plus an IO molecule, which is double immunotherapies and that possibly might be able to improve the response rates with the immuno-oncology molecules. Thirdly, mismatch repair deficiency or microsaturate instability also predicts the response of solid tumors to PD-1 blockade with either nivolumab or pembrolizumab. So one is to reduce the dexamethasone usage to say 4 milligrams or less. Second is to look for the expression of PDL1 and try to use double antibodies like anti PD1 or anti PDL1 and anti CD38 antibody. And third is to look for mismatch, mismatch repair deficiency or MSI instability. And so, this trial of pembrolizumab in a recurrent high grade gliomas, trying to look at only those gliomas which had mismatch repair deficiency. And as you can see, they learned the lessons from the previous trials and so limited the use of dexamethasone to 4 milligrams or less. And now you find out of 12 patients, 4 patients had a disease control, 33% disease control rate. And when compared to the 6% of patients with stable disease uh, who had progressive disease, patients who get control of disease by using mino-oncology molecules have a cumulative improvement in the overall survival. So with immunotherapy, you are not looking at tumor shrinkage. 
can be a stable disease or a partial response. But, but as long as this is not progressing, these patients will have an improvement in overall survival. So I tried to therefore bring across six different sections, trying to tell you and giving you a flavor of what multi-kinase inhibition is, antibody drug conjugates, what they can do, using uh, targeting the polyamine metabolism, the metabolomics, target therapies, gene therapy, and lastly, immunotherapy. Thank you so much, one and all, and especially Manas Bhai and Dr. Zilelim for making me a part of this wonderful neurosurgical conference.